Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shala Adele, teaching associate professor at the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm so pleased to be with you today with a fascinating panel. As you may know, this academic year, we have several panels focusing on the Iranian diaspora authors, their struggles, accomplishments, and ways that they negotiate their diasporic position while writing in their respective host nations. This virtual lecture series is dedicated to exploring how Iranian diaspora authors reflect on the community's attempts at carving out forms of belonging to their host nations authors and discussants uh, specific modes of power, address the specific modes of power and representation that the Iranian diaspora community has developed to rehabilitate their position as members of a minoritized population with ambivalent feelings of belonging. Our moderator today is Dr. Esham Momini, who holds a PhD in gender studies from the University of California, Los Angeles, where she's currently a lecturer. She also has an MA in mass communication from California State University at Northridge. Her research and teaching specializations include the politics of modern Iran and the Middle East, popular culture and gender and sexuality. Please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to post your questions. Dr. Momini will address as many questions as possible. Before handing it over to Dr. Momini, I would like to thank the UNC Persian Studies, Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, and the Center for the Middle East and Islamic Studies that have co-sponsored and made this event possible. Dr. Momini, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chahla, for the introduction. I also like to thank uh, the sponsor of this event and also Professor Yavobi uh, for creating the opportunity for the audience and I to have this discussion with author Farishta Molavi. I also just found out it's uh, Professor Yavobi's birthday. Happy birthday. Um, so I'll start with introducing um, Farishta Molavi, and uh, after that we move to uh, discuss her most recent book, um, 30 Shadows uh, Birds. Born in Tehran in 1953, Farishta Molavi lived and worked there until 1998 when she immigrated to Canada. Molavi has published many works of fiction and nonfiction in Persian, either in Iran or in Europe. Among them, The House of Cloud and Wind and The Sun Fairy and Other Stories. She also translated many literary work by internationally known writers, including Juan Rolfo and Arnold Hauser, and compiled a comprehensive bibliography of short stories in Persian. During her first years in Canada, her dialogue with renowned Canadian writer was published as a chapbook by Penn Canada. She worked and taught at Yale University, University of Toronto, York University, and Seneca College. A fellow at Massey College and a writer in residence at George Brown College, she has been the recipient of awards, including Mehra Khan Literary Award for her novel, The Departures of Season. Her first collection of short stories in English, Stories from Tehran, was released in 2018. She now lives in Toronto and divides her time between writing and advocating freedom of speech and human rights in Iran. Her most recent novel, 30 Shadow Birds, was published by Inanna Publication in 2019. Farish Molavi, please uh, tell us more about your work and your journey as a writer. Uh, thank you so much, Eshojan, for your introduction. Uh, and I'm very delighted to be here. First and most, I would like to say happy birthday to Professor Yagubi and express my thanks to her uh, for inviting me to this webinar. And uh, uh, also, I would like to thank you, Eshojan, for uh, 
this conversation. It's really great for me to share my thoughts with you and with uh, the audience. Uh, let me uh, say something uh, about actually my background. In fact, uh, first, I would like to say that uh, uh, I, I've been a librarian and teacher by training and a writer by nature. Uh, this indicates that uh, for me, writing has never been a business, a job. Uh, it was kind of actually noble uh, uh, passion, you know, kind of metier, uh, kind of tie to life, something that, that makes me actually alive. Uh, I started writing, uh, stories and uh, then uh, uh, editing and translating uh, when I was in the first year of university. Uh, however, uh, uh, the first time actually I published a story, a short story of mine, uh, it was in a chapbook and it was in fact the first year of uh, the revolution uh, when I was 25, uh, and uh, it was the the time actually it was called actually um, Spring of Freedom, <laughs> and uh, obviously it was not the right time for an emerging writer uh, to to get published. Uh, but but anyway, uh, then as you know. Uh, came years of uh, war and uh, persecution, arrest, and uh, a declining process of publishing industry and so many other things. Uh, uh, during all these years, I uh, continued actually drafting uh, fiction works uh, and I, uh, continued actually translating and publishing actually my translations, uh, compiling a bibliography, doing some research, writing articles. However, I didn't actually uh, get published until uh, two years after the ceasefire. Uh, at that time I was 38. The reason why I would like to actually emphasize on my age is that I want to draw your attention to the point that uh, if I had been uh, uh, a, in a right place at the right time, I would have been uh, uh, actually a fiction writer or recognized as a fiction writer at, uh, in my early 20s not at 38, uh, but anyway. Uh, then uh, eventually uh, after actually, I mean, so uh, as I said, um, two years after ceasefire, uh, my first novel and my first uh, collection of short stories, uh, both were released and published uh, simultaneously. Uh, and then for, uh, again, for some years, I didn't uh, publish anything. Eventually in 98, uh, I uh, moved to Canada as an immigrant. In fact, as a uh, woman writer, I excite myself in search of freedom, freedom of expression and uh, individual freedom as well. And uh, in Canada, in my first years of a stay in Toronto, uh, the thing is that uh, honestly, I could not uh, write and uh, I couldn't even uh, read uh, because I had to struggle hard uh, with series of survival jobs. Uh, anyway, uh, however, what happened actually uh, after this kind of turning point for me uh, 
uh, I mean, immigration was that uh, uh, th there was a big change for me in many uh, ways, because as I said, now uh, I could actually free up censorship, I could actually uh, write whatever I wanted. Uh, so I started actually uh, writing about social issues. I started advocating uh, for freedom of speech and mainly uh, censorship and uh, also for women's rights. And at the same time, I started actually discovering, in fact, for myself, uh, literary nonfiction. And uh, so through a process of uh, learning and teaching essay writing, I uh, was driven to writing actually personal essays, which was a big change for me. And I think, I mean, as an immigrant, you know that um, uh, immigration actually provides you with a series of possibilities. Uh, not all of them are pleasant or simple. Uh, however, uh, for me, the big change uh, was that uh, I was attracted by nonfiction and I spent some time and energy uh, on writing nonfiction, uh, uh, as I said, particularly personal essays, because actually I realized that if I want to uh, be a real writer, I have to uh, develop my skills in all genres not just uh, crafting uh, stories. Uh, and uh, what else I can, uh, anyway, uh, over the uh, more than two decades in North America, uh, ad, uh, in addition to uh, doing uh, a lot of things to, uh, to make actually ends meet, uh, I uh, have published, uh, some books, some, some novels, uh, some in English, some in Persian, uh, essays, some in English, some in Persian, uh, uh, published some books in uh, Iran, published some books abroad. And so uh, 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 as a matter of fact, I can say that I, uh, I was, over there, I was here, and uh, I was nowhere, in fact, uh, as a writer, I mean. Uh, so uh, to sum up, I can say that uh, so far, I have published, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, uh, four, uh, four published novels uh, in Persian, one in English, uh, and uh, uh, one unpublished uh, fiction novel in Persian uh, and uh, several, maybe more than four uh, collections of short essays and uh, uh, three published uh, collection of uh, essays, one unpublished, uh, not yet published. And uh, what else? and some chapbooks, uh, in, either in Persian and in um, um, English. And one of them, if, if time allows me, I would like to mention one of the chapbooks. Uh, in my first years in Toronto, after, um, eventually I could actually join uh, Penn Canada and uh, uh, this actually gave me the possibility to do some reading as a writer and to write uh, some essays in, uh, and get published actually in English. And among them, one is this chapbook. Uh, I chose the title, it is Listen to the Read. And uh, this is actually, um, uh, correspondence between me and a Canadian writer. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, it was the first time actually I had the chance to express myself as an immigrant writer. Uh, so 
And now I think if if uh, in the future we may I may read some pieces of that, but right now uh, I don't know what am I supposed to do with it. Just I don't hear you. Yes, yes, that was me. Oh. Let's discuss your last a novel, Thirty Shadow Birds. Mm -hmm. Um, the novel is about a woman named Yalda who flees um, from her dark past and troubled homeland, Iran, to pursue her dream of building a free life, uh, a life free from violence for her son and herself. But in her new haven, she realizes that nightmares haunt not only her past, but also her present and future. She does what she can to survive, but all her plans dissolve like the shadows and ghosts that follow her. Having fled from an authoritarian regime and now living in a North America panic striking by global terrorism, Yalda is obsessed with all the forms and aspects of violence. She's estranged from her beloved son, Nader, who trains to become an armed security guard. And this means he's wearing a uniform and carrying weapons, prepared to be violent. Yalda cannot forget that her first love was shot and killed by a young prison guard and that her beloved stepbrother also met a violent death. This family history is a wound that makes guns taboo and Yalda yearns to feel safe in a troubled world. The novel is part memory, part dream and part present, day-to-day -day struggles of immigrants living in Toronto and Montreal. Uh, first, uh, to give our audience uh, who haven't in case they haven't read the book, an idea of your literary style, it would be great if we start by having you read uh, from the opening of the book. Okay. Uh, I make it easy for uh, potential readers and I read from just the first chapter. Uh, in fact, actually, you know that the opening of a novel is kind of threshold to the something uh, uh, that reader uh, wants to actually to discover. Uh, but this is a dream. I cannot see myself. I'm sitting somewhere. I don't know where. Staring at a quadrupole window. I. Yalda, the beholder, the invisible. I'm looking at a Yalda that is visible, right in front of me, here and now, in four shots. Yalda besouted in a Montreal pub, staring with eyes wide open at the long forehead of the shadow man who is pressing a napkin to her bleeding right temple. Yalda, injured in the Montreal emergency room, her eyes closed tight so as not to see the surgeon's hand stitching her head wound. Yalda, offended in a Toronto office, her eyes fixed on the mouth of negative Judy, who is spitting words onto her face. Sorry, but it didn't include you in the new project. And Yalda, shocked, in her home, looking vacantly at her son, wearing a bulletproof vest and duty belt with a baton. And then I, Yalda, the beholder, unable to bear watching, dive through the window to leave behind a broken me. Yalda, the tangled with the echoes of that awful sound. Bang, bang, bang. She feels her body made of flesh and bones and nerves, with a lump in her throat, dissolving into trickling tears. She opens her eyes to make light. She still cannot determine where she is. Yalda hears his, him humming in his bass voice. It's raining, it's pouring. A crazy girl is touring, bumped her head, went to bed, didn't wake up in the morning. Ah, oh, 
I'm at your place again, she whimpers. Yeah, Kismet is a bastard. It's our annual meeting, this time in Montreal, a bit late though. The shadow man replies from behind the canvas curtain that divides his studio. You had a short nap. You had a short nap after those goddamn hours of waiting at l'urgence. Make sure you get some rest before you go home. Home? I'm not going back to that hell, she laments. Okie dokie, go to the Sheraton Hotel lady or sublet my cave for a month, poor woman. I'm packing my stuff for my tour across Quebec. Having forgotten about her wound, Yalda rolls onto her belly and presses her face against the pillow. The sharp pain makes her groan and roll back onto her side. Need a painkiller? The shadow man asks. No, leave me alone, please. She sobs. Fair enough. I'm going Shema Blunt. Your pills and the key are above the fridge. If you happen to disappear, leave the key with the concierge. She suppresses the urge of blubber by pressing her hand against her mouth. She hears the door creaking. If you don't want to end up in a nut house, get over this fucking breakdown girl, he says, stepping out the door. It's sink or swim, honey. As his words and footsteps fade, Yaldo stops breathing to savor the complete silence. Remember the other time you offered me a story? The shadow man says, storming back inside and breaking the silence right at the moment Yaldo feels a definite urge to resume breathing. What was it you said? Shall I tell it or shall I not tell it? Well, go ahead and tell it. That can be the rent for my place. Yeah, spend time and weave your tail, girl. Yalda hears him slam the door a second time and finally go away. With the echo of the bang resounding in her head, she dashes out of bed and reaches the closed door. She beats her fists against it and bursts into a fit of tears. When her eyes stop tearing up and her wailing comes to an end, she hears her own voice pour out of her mouth. Her words are clear. Yes, I did have a tale for you. And I do have a tale for me. Shall I tell it or shall I not tell it? Shut up, shut up, shut the fuck up. Yes, I shut up, but I do. Thank you. Thank you, Farishta. Let's start with the name of uh, the book, 30 Shadow Birds, which uh, resembles the title of the 13th century uh, prominent poem by Attar, The Conference of the Birds. Why did you choose this name and how does this name relate to the story? Uh, yeah, I think that, um, first of all, the title of this book in fact, it comes from the roots of the story. Uh, I mean, I wanted to actually, to give it a title that goes further than just a name, uh, even a meaning, a concept. Uh, maybe because actually polysemous words usually uh, appeals to me. Um, there is kind of ambiguity and actually allusion in some uh, names and titles. And here, obviously, there is a connotation, right? And uh, uh, for some readers who are familiar with Attar, with Sufism, and with uh, classical, Persian classical literature, obviously, uh, it is easy to uh to to get it uh for others uh, i mean um, non-iranian uh, readers it might not be easy to get it 
but at the first time actually they uh, think about actually the protagonist and then they notice actually the structure of the novel uh, which has 30 chapters okay so and uh, there are also clues in the story to help uh, those kind of readers to to get that so, uh, so it refers to the structure and it refers the philosophical doctrine or concept of diversity and unity. And uh, it also refers actually, it is an allegory and it refers to the whole story of uh, Canticle of Birds and uh, so we know that uh, eventually it is talking about uh, 30 birds and at the same time it is one. So uh, this is actually what you find. You, I mean, uh, the whole uh, book is um, kind of quest uh, for uh, uniting actually the different frag of uh, Yalda's life. You know, she tries actually to unite uh, different parts to, to make a whole of it, to make a meaning for, for her life. And herself, right? Because pieces of her past and how at the end exactly. she's connected to the present moment. Yeah, exactly. Um, Thank you. Fish, one of the main concepts of the book is violence. And um, as I read in the abstract of the book, uh, Yalda has lost two of the most important people of her life to violence. Her, uh, the first, the love of her life, and also uh, her brother, one to um, state violence and the other one into, uh, to interpersonal violence. So now years after, uh, on the other side of the world where she, um, she left homeland because of her main concern is safety. And now her son is, uh, has decided to uh, become an armed guard. So explain this impossibility of avoiding violence in the story. Uh, you are right when you're saying uh, referring to actually violence, uh, in fact, violence is a central or core theme of the book. And violence and fleeing from violence. And, uh, but uh, let me actually forget for a minute uh, Yaldo and uh, let's talk about actually uh, our time, our world. Uh, we know that now we live in a world uh, where violence is normal and practically you can see violence everywhere, uh, not just uh, on headlines, not just on TV, uh, uh, everywhere, not, not only in underdeveloped countries or for instance, uh, Middle East but in everywhere. And uh, you know that after September 11, uh, the, um, there was a, a certain type of atmosphere in North America. And in fact, it was actually panic stricken uh, because of global terrorism. And uh, at, the at, the, at, um, at the same time, for instance, uh, um, you see that, as I said, it's not just somewhere uh, far from here. Violence is everywhere, uh, domestic uh, or uh, political or uh, any, any different, in, in, in the broadest sense of violence, we deal with violence every day. So uh, this aside, Back to Yalda, uh, uh, as, uh, as a refugee, as an immigrant, actually, uh, she, um, she, she did her best to flee from violence 
uh, back home, right? And uh, she didn't want to have her son in that uh, kind of actually, um, that kind of land uh, full of fear of violence and dominance and things like that. Uh, however, after years, after years of wandering around the world, going to Germany and then to uh, France and then Italy and then eventually uh, Canada, uh, all these years uh, she she's actually she's thinking that making a home somewhere, uh, making peace, and then. All of a sudden, something happens, and uh, just on her way, uh, when she's driving, she hears actually from the radio uh, an interview with uh, the mother of uh, somebody who did that horrible massacre in Montreal. And so this was kind of something that triggered uh, something. And then she heard the news uh, from uh, uh, her son. So all these actually, in fact, it means that maybe uh, if I want to put it uh, uh, this way, I may say actually, uh, this is a narrative of uh, um, falling down a rabbit hole. Uh, if you remember, we know that, uh, um, if you remember actually, uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, okay? Alice actually uh, fell down the rabbit hole. And uh, this actually led her to uh, Wonderland, if a land uh, without any logic, full of fantasies. Yalda, uh, on another uh, setting time, uh, in fact, actually, she also fell down a rabbit hole, which means actually she, she thinks that she has found an open door, but that open door actually leads her to many closed doors. And so uh, this is actually again a land uh, uh, without uh, without any logic, full of fears, nightmares, and dreams. You no, know? uh, uh, this is actually the the whole story of this narrative. That when we think that we okay now we are okay, we fled from. Uh, some threat, some horror, some nightmare. And so now we are safe. But all of a sudden, we find out that no, again, we are not safe. Th that was the, um, what I wanted actually to, um, to, to explore. So you yourself, um, you have a hybrid identity. You're an Iranian Canadian, and Yalda is an Iranian Canadian uh, woman. And how have your uh, own experiences been reflected in Yalda's character? And uh, why do you think it's important that uh, that these experiences uh, be told and be included in uh, the Western uh, North American literary world? Um, uh, we know that, in fact, nobody has one single identity, right? Uh, we have different identities. Or we may say that our uh, identity has uh, uh, multiple roles. Uh, let's think about Yalda, uh, a woman, uh, ESL teacher, architect, uh, refugee, immigrant, mother, uh, lover. Uh, so different aspects of identity. Uh, 
uh, now if we think about actually an immigrant uh, woman, uh, an immigrant in fact is a bicultural uh, person. Uh, so she actually, she carries actually the culture, language, whatever from homeland and then uh, somewhere else actually she has to she get another language, another uh, place, another uh, labels and identities. So this is in, in fact a kind of a um, divided self. This is what all, all of us in, in fact experience. Uh, it's kind of uh, hyphenated uh, identity, hybrid identity. And you're living in between two different cultures, two different languages, two different places. And in fact, this, uh, this is kind of actually, you, you may say that your past uh, interferes your present. The collection, recollections of whatever memory you have had from your past life actually interfere into your present. Uh, this is the situa situation uh, where we find actually Yalda. But uh, if you want to ask me about my own identity, that's different. Uh, I, what I have common with Yalda is that I'm an immigrant woman like Yalda. But uh, when it comes to me as a writer, my identity, I, I, for instance, we have a professional identity. Obviously, you see uh, through the book that Yalda tries hard to prove her professional identity as an architect uh, in this new land, right? For a writer like me, that's the same story. At the same time, there is uh, something more than that, and it is the uh, it is the language, which is actually vital, essential uh, in forming my uh, professional identity. Uh, if we have time, uh, I can explain more. But let's go. For, for instance, let's skip this and go to the other. I think, I think this is a good time to talk about uh, the industry and how, uh, how the literary industry in North America is uh, welcoming towards new voices and, and is open to the stories of immigrants. Um, so if you can uh, provide your experience with the industry, that would be. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you heard about actually um, melting pot in uh, the context of uh, US and the uh, mosaic culture in our context, Canadian context. Uh, and um, this is actually, this is uh, a diverse uh, society. Uh, and uh, so uh, many things have been uh, down so far to actually to to um, to to try actually to uh, establish this particular mosaic culture. Uh, I'm talking about Canada. Uh, however, uh, the reality is uh, that, um, as you know. Um, this doesn't mean that uh, immigrants uh, are um, equal uh, as uh, other citizens. Um, this, this is one barrier. And uh, the other thing for writers, in fact, is the situation and the atmosphere of publishing industry in uh, North America uh, and the system actually we're living. Uh, now I'm talking about the whole North America, at least 
if not Western world. Uh, and uh, th this means actually uh, the, the values uh, are based on the foundation of this system. And this means actually uh, the meaning of success, for instance, for a writer, uh, the meaning of business, the meaning of uh, mass production and the meaning of consumption, things like this means they, they have things like this actually have changed so many, um, uh, so many things in the world of uh, publishing industry. Uh, and uh, this uh, in fact means that in order to, uh, for instance, let me uh, say something about myself. Um, this particular book uh, has a Canadian publisher, and it is uh, it has been published in Canada, and uh, and uh, the story is about uh, Canadian, Iranian Canadian. So uh, overall. Uh, uh, overall, actually, it is more Canadian that, than Iranian. Uh, and uh, however, uh, uh, getting published doesn't mean that uh, this, uh, this, the, this particular book, for instance, can get uh, the right place in the market. Why? Because uh, there are other factors involved. And uh, the, um, again, in this world and right now, you have, to, uh, you have to find a niche and then you have to uh, display yourself. Uh, and uh, very overtly, you are actually advised to sell yourself uh, in order to be, uh, Red, for instance. So things like this, this means actually, uh, mm, I, uh, I remember some years ago, I uh, wrote an essay and recently it was published and it was uh, the, the, the title of the essay, which was a very short one, a clumsy little story. And it was actually about the double bind of an immigrant writer because the, problem is uh, that uh, you are not in the right place. So uh, you cannot actually find the right place for your work. And uh, uh, this means actually, although you may get published, it doesn't mean that uh, your work is visible to others. That's, um, and, uh, and the, other, uh, the other factor, for instance, is that the uh, book market uh, 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 prefer, prefers actually to welcome exotic uh, books, for instance. Uh, for 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 whatever reason, uh, so uh, th th there are so many. Uh, I, I I want to say that there are so many barriers uh, in front of, uh, yeah, in fact, immigrant writers. Thank you, Farishta. I have more questions, but I want to make sure that audience also have uh, an opportunity to ask their questions. So please, if you have any questions, write it in Q&A and I will, um, I will read it. Um, I have, my question is about the emotions that um, the story evokes in, in the reader. And it, uh, it, the story deals with uh, thoughts and experiences that are, uh, that make audience uncomfortable. So why the story is so dark? Uh, let me borrow <laughs> from Tolstoy. You remember there is a quote by Tolstoy saying that all happy families are alike. 
And I want to add to this that uh, 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 at least uh, personally, uh, I think the stories of happy people or happy families, uh, it's just boring. <laughs> so maybe that could be a reason for me to prefer to write about dark side of the moon uh, rather than the uh, bright side. Uh, but uh, but uh, this aside, yes, I agree with you that not this book, maybe all of my works, all uh, they have uh, been written with kind of brutal honesty. And uh, 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 I can't deny that they are, they are bitter. They are not sweet at all. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, what I can say is that uh, back to the story of Yaldo, uh, this is horrible, I, I understand. Uh, uh, the character is a tormented character. Uh, uh, she has actually uh, left behind trauma. Uh, she, she lost her beloved sister she lost actually her first love. She lost her uh, brother. And she, she's living a very hard uh, life full of uh, hardship. So obviously it is, it is not sweet at all. But at the same time, it is not a book about failure. It is in fact about resilience because the whole book is a quest for uh, finding actually, finding a way out. Uh, so I look at that like this. I, while I agree that it is uh, bitter, at the same time, I don't look at it as uh, something very, um, uh, something just dark. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it ends with hope and connecting to the to self and, and the present moment, which uh, is promising. Um, Delani is asking how much of your own experience influenced the writing of 30 Shadow Birds and how much it's fictitious. So you already answered this question. I don't know if, um, uh, there's anything else you'd like to add and um... no not really the, the point is that uh, maybe I'd better say something uh, uh, generally speaking in fact uh, honestly uh, uh, there isn't a very clear distinction between uh, between my real life and uh, the life of the characters. At the same time, it's, they are completely different. You know what I'm saying? Because um, characters are formed obviously in the mind of a writer. But uh, the point is that fiction is fiction. Fiction is not memoir. Fiction is not uh, biography. And uh, if, a, if a reader, I mean, obviously novice reader might think that, okay, I'm reading this book by this author. So uh, I see the picture of author in the book, but this is not true. Uh, after a while, uh, uh, a, professional, uh, a professional reader uh, can realize the difference between fiction and nonfiction. 
I think uh, probably Delaney is more interested in, uh, I'm more interested in it. like how much when you write fi fiction, how much of uh, you, where do you draw that boundaries between your own experiences and your own identity and the characters? Like, um, That was the, um, what I wanted actually to, uh, to emphasize, you know, immediately, if the writer uh, loses the control on what she's writing and uh, mixes the lines between genre, you know, that, that's not good because if I'm a fiction writer, if I'm writing a fiction, I should know that this particular realm, the realm of this fiction, this novel, this story is not a realm for me. It is for the characters, not for me. You know what I mean? It's a big difference. A good writer is, uh, you remember I said something that I wanted to uh, practice and experience different genre of writing. A novice writer may write about herself rather than characters, fictional characters. Uh, but a professional writer knows about this. If I want to write about myself, I write my biography, I write memoir. That's another, uh, another actually, realm, another uh, territory. Um, thank you. Uh, Ketaki asks, was the name Yalo chosen purposefully in order to parallel the character's struggle regarding her own, her how she was living in fear and nightmares throughout her life? Yalo, you know that in Persian actually, Yalo is the longest night of the year. And I, I think the reference is clear, at least for people who knows the meaning of Yaldo. Yeah, the longest night of the year. But obviously after the longest night. Yes, it ends. Yeah. Morning. Yeah. Uh, one of our audience from Facebook asked, how has the Iranian hyphenated life living in other societies affected their perspective on life? Is this true for Yaldo? Obviously, uh, leaving your homeland and going to somewhere to make a new home for yourself is a turning point uh, and a life-changing uh, um, uh, event uh, in everybody's life. So. Uh, but it depends the, uh, if, you, if you want to talk about actually the changes, uh, again, it depends on the person, you know, every individual is different. So many, I see, I, I've been living, you know, I, I've been living more, for more than two decades uh, here. And still I know many, uh, I'm talking about actually, my fellow countrymen. Uh, I know some people, they haven't, I mean, they haven't changed a lot. Uh, because somehow they're living in kind of ghetto. It might be a mental ghetto, it might be a geographical ghetto, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, some people, uh, after this kind of shock or uh, major change actually, they try to actually uh, they, they open their mind to uh, new horizons. And 
so it depends on the person, I think. I, I, I don't think that the, the, there is just one way. Uh, um, however, overall, I, I'm sure that uh, age is a factor. Obviously, um, the younger you are, uh, the, um, the more flexible you are to changes. Um, another question uh, related, Kamran, thanks you. And Kamran um, writes, you mentioned that you don't feel you're being an equal citizen as an immigrant in Canada. And uh, wondering to what extent this might be the impact of how the new home treats you versus the need for nostal nostalgia as a diasporic writer for, that creates that feeling. It seems to me that we all carry a piece of our back inevitably and hence never find our place between the old home and the new home. Uh, yeah. Uh, regarding what I said about actually, the, the, this, this is actually, uh, this is true. This is a fact and we have to accept uh, uh, the reality. The reality is actually, uh, I'm talking about uh, Canada right now. I'm not talking about other countries. Uh, when you, uh, when somebody from, for instance, Iran comes to uh, Canada, uh, uh, obviously on paper, uh, all citizens are equal. But if you remember George Orwell's work uh, still we are living in a world that uh, people, uh, everybody is equal, but some are more equal than others. So uh, in some way, not in all, uh, not in uh, all aspects, but uh, in different aspects and from different aspects, uh, the, the person, the immigrant, no matter from where, uh, he or she has come, uh, may feel that uh, uh, she, she is a second class citizen. Uh, not on paper, not, on, not based on the uh, law, but this is the nature of human being. When you stay for uh, a while somewhere, you have kind of actually you feel kind of superiority over other people who are, for instance, newcomers. And so it's complicated, but back to uh, the, the other thing is that what I said was uh, basically about actually the situation and conditions for an immigrant writer. And this one, has nothing to do with actually, for instance, bad intention of somebody. It's a matter of actually, it's a matter of language. It's a matter of the uh, factors dominated the publishing industry. The point is that it, it, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not simple like that, for instance. Okay, this uh, woman, for instance, is coming from uh, say Middle East, so uh, she, she is actually a second class. No, it's not like that. But the point is that uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, you are kind of marginalized uh, writer. You don't have enough connections. You don't have uh, enough tools you, uh, to, to, to be actually to be in the loop. So it, it, it is complicated. It's not because of bad intention or even it's not because of laws because are, at least on paper, there is no inequality. Um, Mehrak asks, I know that all works of fiction write, writers are their children and they like them, but what is your favorite work? Sorry, what? What is your favorite writing? Which, which one of your books or uh, stories you like the most? 
of your work? Of my own work? Yes. Hmm. Um, it's a tough question. I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. Uh, it's exactly what you said. You know, they are like, they are like children. So sometimes you think that, okay, if my, if this particular uh, story or book uh, uh, didn't, uh, wasn't seen as it deserved, then you may feel kind of sympathy towards that. And, uh, but at the same time, I, I really don't know about my, uh, about fictions, uh, whatever I uh, wrote, but what I can say is that I try to forget about whenever, whenever a fiction uh, is published, honestly, I don't want to think about it at all. Since then, actually, I want to be disconnected with that work. And I want to uh, put it in the hand of the readers. It's not my business anymore. Uh, particularly for somebody like me, for each uh, fiction, for each novel, um, without uh, exaggerating, uh, I spent about 10 years. So after that, I really don't want to think about it. At the same time, uh, as I said, when a book uh, uh, is not lucky enough to be seen, when a book is not lucky enough to be in the hand of readers, for instance, when I read, when I write something in Persian, my original uh, reader is in Iran. And I'm deprived of this because of whatever you know better than me, right? So this actually, this makes things complicated. Uh, it's 10.04, just one last question. Um, Andrew asked, what gave you an interest in literary nonfiction after you moved to North America, despite writing mostly fiction before it, beforehand? Uh, can you repeat it again, please? Uh, what gave you an interest in literary nonfiction? How did you become interested in writing nonfiction after writing mostly fiction? Okay, okay. that's a good question. Uh, as, uh, but I, I think actually I gave you some clue. Uh, you remember I said that uh, as long as I was in Iran, I never thought about writing, uh, uh, for instance, at, uh, first of all, at that time, actually in Iran, essay writing was not, uh, I mean, in the, in the particular meaning of personal uh, essay writing uh, was not actually trendy. Uh, so my first discovery uh, outside Iran was that uh, uh, despite the situation we had in Iran, uh, here, personal is an essay is something very uh, popular. And then, uh, but this is actually not the, uh, not the main reason. The main reason for me uh, is that it gives you, uh, it gives you actually uh, the possibility of expressing yourself. You, you, you remember I said fiction is fiction for me. Story is something else. But, uh, and I never, uh, I never wrote, for instance, memoir. I, uh, I was not trained to talk about myself. There wasn't enough freedom. And still, there is not enough freedom in Iran 
uh, to let people express themselves unless if they want to write memoir or things like this. Personal essay is completely different because it is a process of discover, discovering. It is a process of thinking. It is a process of exploring yourself. It's not just the writing, it's not just self-expression. Self-expression in different ways right now uh, is very popular uh, in Iran. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about personal essay, which is completely different. Although it starts with, uh, from you as an individual, it is actually, uh, it, is, it is a way of thinking and uh, discovering. So that makes it very actually pleasant and uh, exciting for me. And maybe if uh, in another life, uh, I could uh, do that, just focus on personal essay. But, uh, but then at the same time, I really love uh, novels. Uh, thank you, Farish Semolavi, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you for um, your efforts in including the voice of immigrant women, Iranian women, uh, in the literary world of Western um, North America. And um, I want to finish. Thank you, uh, the audience, for uh, joining us. I'd like to finish with Mina Tahiri's um, comment. She writes, uh, thank you so much for having um, Mrs. Molavi. I can't express enough how I've been impressed and touched by reading this beautiful, sensible novel. This is the book of seeking for identity and bringing the integration within the scattered personality and also within a diverse society among all kinds of hyphenated immigrants. This is a book that can connect people, especially women from different backgrounds and make other stories to be heard. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, and we should finish. Um, <laughs> Ten minutes after. We are out of time. Uh, thank you, Doctors Molevi and Momeni, for this fascinating uh, panel. Uh, thanks also to our audience for joining us and uh, for the uh, questions. Uh, we hope you can also join us uh, again for our next panel with Dr. Valid Ziad on December 2nd about his new book. Uh, goodbye and have a great weekend.